Greetings all, Dr. Raphael X here with a friend of mine, Dr. Thomas Michaud, who is a well fellow fellow scholar and um, has written a very interesting book, uh, which is called After Justice, which we will be talking about today in this video. But before anything else, please subscribe, click on the like button, notifications button, leave a comment, all that good stuff. And um, actually, before anything else, we should at least do our, the sign of the cross to have bless, may God bless our, uh, the show together, and also to be reminded of our baptism. So we just do a sign of the cross here in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. So Dr. Thomas Michaud, thanks for joining us. He is a, a very brief introduction about him. He has a lot of credentials here. He will also talk a little bit about himself. Um Interesting history, retired uh, Dean School of Professional Studies and Professor of Philosophy at West Liberty University, where he earned his master's and got his PhD. Uh, no, I'm sorry. He got his PhD from Marquette University and his bachelor's from Fairfield University. So Dr. Michelle will definitely um, correct me in, in any of these credentials. He has taught at Wheeling Jesuit University, Marquette University, Mount St. Mary's University, Siena University, Rockhurst University, and well, there's a bunch of institutions there. His international experience includes a Smith Fellowship for the Husserl Ar Archives at the University of Louvain, Belgium, a senior Fulbright lectureship at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and an inaugural lecture at the Reverend Jacet Voroniecki Memorial English Language Lectures in Philosophy. So many words here. That's at the, the university, the great university, Catholic University of John Paul II in Lublin, Poland, where I actually almost studied there, but um, beside the point, uh, a fast, very good university. So, Dr. Welcome. Thanks for coming on. And if you, uh, if you can... Just talk briefly about yourself, what kind of what interests you to do what you do, um, fellow philosopher, um, interested in the theology, definitely in business ethics, kind of very, very integral person here. But yes, if you could take it away here, Dr. Michel. Thank you, Raphael, and I'm pleased to be invited to conduct this interview. Um, my career um, has been variegated. Uh, um, um, many different institutions, as you uh, uh, mentioned in, in, in your introduction, um, it, broad international experience. Um, um, so variegated, it's putting it mildly. Um, I began my studies, um, serious uh, philosophy, in areas of continental philosophy, particularly phenomenology. And then um, realized after time that what I was seeking from phenomenology just wasn't going to happen. Uh, it was a dead end. So I uh, began to um, open myself more and more to traditional Aristotelian Thomistic thought. Um, uh, in doing so, I was influ influenced by a number of uh, various thinkers and had the privilege of getting to know some of them personally. Um, perhaps the four major influences on me were um, Michael Novak, again, someone I had the uh, just pleasure the joy of uh, knowing personally uh, many, many interactions in the years. Um, the Jesuit uh, Reverend James Shaw from Georgetown University was a, um, well, he was a mentor and a, a, a confidant, uh, just an excellent, uh, what we would call old school Jesuit. Um, Gabriel Marcel, um, I didn't ever meet Marcel, did, never heard him speak live in person, but I became attached to his thought um, uh, uh, 
probably in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and followed it uh, carefully over those years. Uh, um, his corpus is just tremendous. It presents an alternative to the phenomenological uh, method. Um, and um, sometimes he's called a Christian existentialist. He's not. Um, he's a unique philosopher. Um, and besides the strict philosophy, he's also a very cultured uh, thinker in regard to his many, many plays and um, his music. Um, just, just a, a, a varied and 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 uh, engaging uh, philosophical thought. Um, um, so Marcel had a, a major effect on um, my work. Um, in fact, the book After Justice, I have a section containing some essays that uh, reference Marcel and apply his thought to some of the issues with. Um, progressivism and contemporary culture. Um, and finally, um, a huge influence on me was uh, Pope John Paul II. Um, um, that began very early on, um, sometime around um, 85, 86, perhaps. Um, I, a story I like to tell is that I was in um, Belgium in uh, Louvain, researching my qualifying paper. Um, I was researching at the Husserl archives, but initially I had to submit a qualifying paper for my PhD program. And I was, I came upon an essay uh, by uh, a philosopher, Carol Wojtyla, um on Max Scheler. I was literally working on that essay, trying to, um, as best as possible, understand the analysis of um, Shaler that Wojtyla was offering. Um, also listening to the radio, the BBC. Um, and what do I hear? That um, our next Pope, taking the title Pope John Paul II, is Carol Wojtyla. It was, I mean, I believe um, strongly that it was the Holy Spirit at work in that. Uh, uh, and um, from that point on, I was um, devoted to his thought. Um, his encyclicals, his uh, uh, writings and um, on the human person, uh, tremendous. Um, um, uh, one of the uh, most... Uh, prolific popes, I think, in history. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, um, and uh, this work, After Justice, um, is, the title is, in a sense, a, uh, a, a joinder to um, the work by McIntyre, After Virtue, because after virtue, we're left with after justice, too. Right. And in a nutshell, the theme is that progressivism, and I'll talk more about that coming up, but progressivism has, in effect, erased what we understand traditionally as justice. There is no justice from any traditional point of view today. Um, what, it, what, what replaces justice is a hodgepodge of sometimes incoherent social justice causes. Uh, um, and that's the situation we're facing. Um, one of the reasons why I put together this book, which is a collection of essays, um, all uh, thematized around various relevant uh, topics um, uh, that I produced over the past uh, uh, perhaps 15 years or so. Um, anyway, um, 
I discovered in connection with um, the uh, Synod movement, uh, which began in the uh, late uh, 20 teens huh? um, mm -hmm. in parishes, uh, attending Synod discussions, and I don't know, Raphael, if you're familiar with the Synod and so on, uh, the yes. global Synod. Uh, oh, yes. Attending Synod discussions with uh, fellow parishioners, um, I became really concerned about what they knew and didn't know about our own Catholic heritage. And <clears throat> I discovered, moreover, and I was in many discussions throughout the diocese, uh, the Wheeling Charleston Diocese of West Virginia, what, is, what I discovered, moreover, was that they didn't have background in our faith to enable them to argue, and I mean argue in the best sense of the word, rationally formulate positions um, consistent with our heritage, um, but also positions which are effective answers and guidelines to dealing with so many of the issues that swirl around us in culture today. It's a progressive culture uh, in which we live and our rich, profound tradition can give us a um, platform, a basis, a foundation to address so many and, and effectively resist so many of these um, cultural issues that inundate us. No. So it was kind of an answer to my fellow parishioners um, that I put together this uh, collection of essays dealing with um, Catholic challenges, uh, the way a Catholic can challenge. Um, progressive culture right that's um that's really fascinating you mentioned that because what you speaking right now i'm reminded by uh michael davies book he your three volume series of on pretty much vatican II liturgical reform and then he talks about how really the goal was ecumenism like that's the final goal for basically everything that was kind of in the mentality what, what he called ecumenia which is so that really that's not surprising with this whole synodal movement where you have this crazy pluralism where it's even invited to have people of different faiths it's absurd obviously in the in the paris setting this wasn't explicitly mentioned for the synodal thing but it's 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 kind of within that spirit to have um, a different faiths contribute, you know, given their input for the sake of of change. And this is this is what's underlying here, the progressivism, it seems. And maybe we can get into that. This uh, one of the characteristics you mentioned is that it's constant. And that's that's where the ism comes in, I guess. It is not like you can be progressive in a sound way. Obviously, I mean, there's change, you know, to be wise, you you need to know what to change and what not to change, right? That's what wisdom is kind of all about, in a sense. But progressivism is nonstop change, like it, just change exists. There's nothing immutable about anything, and especially justice. And that becomes a problem because then if, if social justice is just, uh, you know, even causes the very notion of justice to be immutable, then really justice, you know, it devolves into really anti-justice. And then you don't even distinguish because there are no definitions. So it's a metaphysical attack. Um, so I don't know if, if you could talk more to how, what is pro kind of progressivism, how is distinguished from, you don't use the word, I don't think you, I'm not sure if you use the word traditionalism. I don't remember reading that from the work. I think you just, uh, you might use that word traditionalism, but um because you can understand a lot from traditionalism. Um, that's actually a heresy that's yeah. condemned too by the church. <laughs> so that, but there's there is a sound traditionalism, of course. But uh, if you could distinguish the two, 
in, in reference to, or it doesn't have to be in reference to justice, maybe just kind of giving that, that framework to work with. Yes. What do we mean by progressivism? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Progressivism really started early modern period, late uh, kind of enlightenment um, in the um, 18th century, um, 19th century, 20th century, and what we have today. Um, some of the uh, originators, there are many, but some of the originators of uh, uh, progressivism, not in so many words, though, um, people like uh, Marquis de Condorcet, you know, progress of the human mind, that sort of thing. Uh, earlier, a, a Rousseau uh, is a, an originator of progressivism. Um, so in the um, early 18th century, progressivism began to um, take, gather some steam. Um, and then with the emergence of Marxist thought, mid to late um, um, 1800s, huh? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, was integrated into progressivism. So much that in the uh, 19th century, progressivism be it became kind of widespread in various different forms. Um, um, so that at the turn of the century, in the early 20th century, um, picking up various strains from the um, 19th and 18th centuries, progressivism actually became a political party in the United States, um, the Progressive Party. Um, it didn't last that long, um, but it made its mark. And part of making its mark is that it transformed um, from a kind of um, mixed bag it, uh, philosophy, kind of an oleo of uh, various ideas, uh, some Marxism here, some uh, positivism there, that kind of thing, um, an oleo of ideas. Uh, it, it, it transformed with the um, emergence of a progressive political party to a thoroughgoing ideology. And, and ideology is not philosophy. Um, um, philosophy seeks answers. Philosophy seeks the truth, wisdom, etc. Ideology, well, an ideologue has all the answers even before the questions arise. Huh? Huh? So progressivism as an ideology became kind of frozen in its uh, basic uh, development. Um, um, and it's that pre-World War II ideology that is with us today. Um, it takes on, it has taken on various forms. Progressivism spawn, and so these are derivative from progressivism. Uh, Postmodernism is a progressive spawn. Um, cancel culture, mm. Poli the culture of political correctness, wokeism. These are all derivative forms of progressivism. Um, um, some lasted for, you know, maybe a decade or less, um, um, but um, they all, in one way or another, advance the ideological agenda of progressivism. So progressivism is the kind of umbrella for these derivative forms. Um, and um, as an ideology, progressivism um, idolizes, I can't use any other word, um, um, social justice. Right. It is its supreme value social justice um this is a kind of it began as a kind of populism um and uh, uh in the early 20th century that that, that there was a, a strong uh a marriage between populism and progressivism um, um, but 
today, um, with its derivative form, some still active, others have gone more and more like by the wayside, like postmodernism isn't the rage it used to be. huh? Um, right. Uh, it really wasn't even postmodernism. It was a kind of um, anarchic anti-modernism, basically. Right. Uh, so uh, th th it wasn't after modern. It was just um, a oppos opposing, oppositional to modernism. We could talk more on that later. Right. But um, currently, what the ideology, the agenda of progressivism represents a serious, serious um, challenge, um, threat even, one might say, to um, traditional Catholic thought. Um, again, the um, Aristotelian, Thomistic roots, heritage of Catholic thought. Um, and for Catholics, in order to be able to meet the issues, the challenges that progressivism poses, it's critical that we become um, alert to our own tradition and how understanding aspects of that tradition can help us um, uh, resist uh, progressivism's uh, um, sometimes very enticing, seductive uh, um, views right yeah and I, I mean i think it's fascinating how you mentioned that um well that that well andrew breitbart he he said tr traditionally uh which you have him as a traditional and, and this famous quote which he got from george washington based basically george washington said something similar that politics is downstream from culture and then culture is downstream from religion but interestingly, you you write that progressivism has the values inverted, where first you establish the political realm, right? It's first you establish the political realm, and then we will, then culture will stem from that. So really, what progressivists seek, they do they don't care about cultural issues, and they kind of criticize those who who do. They don't understand that, and that's fascinating. They don't understand you voting, for example, for a candidate based on cultural issues. But uh, traditionals, they that's their main focus because they realize that is the basis of ulterior change and sound change. So if you have a sound culture, then you will have everything else will be sound politics and even ultimately the economy. But with pro with progressives, progressivists, we can say they um they have the, the values inverted. So I don't know if you want to comment a little more on that. How, how is the economy come in here? Um, the relation between politics and culture, if you can. Uh... Sure, sure. And you had it uh, right on the nose. Um, um, Andrew Bart Breitbart, as you point out, uh, Raphael, um, uh, believed that Politics is downstream from culture, and culture is downstream from religion. Culture, especially morality, according to Breitbart, flow from religion, and politics and economics flow from culture. This is a view that was endorsed by Washington. Uh, if you just take a look at his famous uh, farewell address, you'll see that articulated in very clear terms. John Adams recognize that um, um, religion and mor morality alone can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. Um, um, Richard, the late Richard John Newhouse, um, um, the uh, founder of uh, First Things, the journal First Things, he believed that politics is chiefly a function of culture at the heart of culture is morality, and at the heart of morality is religion. So, the traditional, the conservative view can rep be represented in this way. Religion spawns morality, which develops organically in culture, 
This in turn influences politics, economics, education, the justice system, and the media. Progressives have flipped that. I mean, they just don't accept that traditional conservative point of view. Um, their view can be, I think, summarized by the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan, senator from New York. Um, he once said that the central conservative or traditional truth is that it is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. The central liberal truth is that politics can change a culture and save it from itself. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, that's what we're experiencing. Um, progressivism, being influenced by Marxist socialism, becoming a political, not philosophy, but ideology, becoming a political ideology in the 20th century and spawning all those derivative forms, postmodernism, etc. cetera. Um, progressivism believes that at the pinnacle is politics. Politics is the apex of what's important in any society. This is a special kind of politics, however. It's a collectivism. You might say a Marxist socialism. That politics, with its collectivism, values supremely social justice. So, collectivist politics, valuing social justice, generates economics. Economics is directed by those collectivistic social justice causes. Huh? And yeah. it's used as a kind of weapon, in fact, to ensure that its agenda, the items, its, its causes are made real, are enacted within society. Economics becomes a tool of progressive actualization. And these views all together are what create a culture. Politics, collectivism, social justice as a um, value, supreme value of such collectivism, generating a kind of Marxist socialist economics, um, coming together, form culture, which in turn influences education, the justice system, media, etc. cetera. Um, but consider, this is important, in the traditional view, the conservative view, um, religious morality is paramount, religion. It flows into culture. Um, and that morality, as it influences culture, is developing, growing organically in the culture. Um, mm. It's not something that is uh, foisted upon the culture. Again, it emerges organically within the culture. Um, it's not being enforced by economics, which chooses winners and losers, which in line with its supreme value of social justice, um, has a, a, a basic uh, a division between the so-called oppressor and the oppressed, huh? Um, that kind of Marxist attitude. Um, no, um, uh, uh, in the traditional view, culture develops 
that morality it organically within its various areas and that morality helps to secure uh, prosperity helps to secure a kind of ethos that um, is um, more uh, enduring, more permanent. It's rooted in the very soil of the culture itself. Um, our founders believe that. Um, um, but in progressivism, that morality is, as I said, foisted upon the culture. Culture must, in order to maintain, in order to not be canceled, um, culture must adopt the morality uh, that um, uh, the collectivist politic demands, because if you don't, then you're left out in the cold economically. You're punished by the state, by the government, economically. Um, so these social justice causes that um, generate the economics begin to um, manifest themselves in all the various aspects of culture and education and the justice system, as I mentioned, and definitely, definitely in the media. Um, um, we're surrounded by them, inundated with that uh, social justice ideology. Um, and for the Catholic today, who has a um, sense of what our tradition means and what our faith, um, uh, so to speak, stands for, um, the Catholic today is beleaguered amidst these uh, social justice uh, projects that um, progressivism um, uh, uh, employs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, you know, when you were speaking, I was just, just thinking of some people like libertarians, for example, they would say they're culturally or morally progressive, but they're economically um, there was economically they are conservative, right? They're they're free marketists. But what you're what this article shows, what the whole book shows in different parts of the book, is that you really can't. The free market has to be uh, based on a sound individualism, which is based on a sound culture and morality. So progressives, the focus of progressives on the economy, on politics and the economy, kind of devoid from morality or without having morality as a basis is, is literally them shooting themselves. Well, not literally, but is them shooting themselves in the foot, right? Because it's like, wait a minute, you, you're destroying yourselves, right? And that's why we say it, 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 progressivism is, and you seem to allude to this, is social suicide, right? It's, it's, it's killing yourself. It's, it does seem like though, on a, on the surface, or maybe not. I don't know if that more that you can see morality as a hindrance to uh, maybe social success somehow or economic success. But at the same time, you have to establish basic moral principles as a, an ethos, as you mentioned, for morality to thrive too. So it's uh, it's it's really you you cannot you cannot diverge from the moral question. And so progressivism, pro progressivists denying morality seem to actually establish and be very dogmatic morally. And this is where social justice comes in. I think you, you mentioned it as a moral system, as a infall as a religion, based on this moral system that is that preaches social justice. And again, it's it's just this this confusion that they have because basically. Free, I mean, a successful, and this is what you say, successful society, successful politics, successful economics is really based on the Catholic view uh, uh, of Catholic morality, right? It's as the basis of such a system. So it's, uh, I mean, what, what do you make of today of society of people, like their main concern is, they would ask voters this, their main concern is the economy. 
as opposed to cultural issues like what's going on here are is are more people becoming progressives or is there is like progressivism kind of um inundating the society without us realizing it or because you you even see conservative traditional people um politically we can say or maybe they're just in name only but their their main concern concern at least according to polls is the economy right are economic questions as opposed to moral and cultural questions so I, what, what's going on here i don't know chime in yeah that's uh that's important um good observation um many i believe who um point to the um, economy as the main issue facing us today uh, is sagging uh, uh, um, overtaxed um, over government regulated economy huh um, um, I think because progressives use the economy it's 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 their weaponized uh, strength huh they use the economy to um, enact their social justice projects, the uh, uh, DIE, mm -hmm. the ESG, if you're familiar with those oh, yes. terms or acronyms. Um, <clears throat> they use the economy as a kind of cudgel to ensure that their social justice moral morality, their uh, so-called moral projects are accepted. And I think the resistance and the uh, uh, disappointment, great disappointment in the economy today is uh, it's valid, of course, uh, um, sure. but it is a kind of outlet for those who aren't really alert to progressivism's um, machinations of culture, but they know that what is being done to the economy, um, this kind of a socialist dirigeme, um, um, this kind of socialist uh, command and control co economy, um, isn't what they want. It doesn't have a sense of at all of freedom. And moreover, they are uh, finding a way to recover to a certain extent um, their um, individuality. And I want to talk about this in, in, in kind of a uh, more depth now, Raphael, because yep. this is a piece to progressivism that really undercuts, um, totally undercuts our um, Catholic uh, heritage. Um, you know, one of the uh, brilliant, um, I think, um, works of um, um, John Paul II is um, his uh, right crossing the threshold of hope. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk more about hope coming up. But in that work, uh, he talks about the great anthropocentric shift, the great anthropocentric shift. And the great anthropocentric shift, now this isn't John Paul II talking, it's my um, uh, my thought here, um, but the great anthropocentric shift occurred with the emergence of progressivism. That great anthropocentric shift that John Paul II um, um, warns of, okay, began in the uh, early modern period with thinkers like Descartes, etc. And it was a shift uh, so that it privileged a su subjectivist philosophy of consciousness over a realistic philosophy of existence. Philosophy of consciousness over philosophy of, of existence. This anthropocentric shift, okay, um, essentially um, separated the human being from reality. 
so much of the so-called science of progressivism um, as an ideology is a science ultimately of constructs, not models based on uh, an understanding and discovery of reality, of nature, but constructs. Nature itself for the progressive is a construct. It's malleable. It's fluid. It changes according to the way in which we want to define it. it it's changed according to the way in which it will best serve a particular progressive moral cause, the overall agenda as well. Um, nature is fluid. Um, um, and this redounds upon even what we know as human nature. I mean, consider the progressive um, mania to a certain certain quarters, I would say, with um, LBGTQIA plus, I don't know if I got everything all, uh, covered there, <laughs> but you know, when the emphasis is on the philosophy of consciousness, what happens is that and constructs created by consciousness, what happens is that the person is divided. There is uh, this physical body and then there's consciousness. It's a kind of Cartesian dualism, huh? What we used to call mind and body are segregated, okay? So the body is in a sense considered to be a type of construct of the mind. I mean, uh, the body isn't looked at as something uh, real and foundational. Um, St. John Paul II's uh, theology of the body is so revelatory on this. Um, um, the body is considered to be something that can be operated on. The body is considered to be something, a construct that can be redefined. Um, um, so the consciousness, which is more and more just a, a kind of bundle of feelings, huh? a human bundle of perceptions or feeling and feelings, um, whatever the dysphoria affecting the consciousness, the subjective consciousness is meted out on the body. So we can change gender. Gender is fluid. Um, um, all of our sexuality is fluid. Whatever feel, whatever sentiment we have um, defines who and what we are sexually. There's no nature. Nature as a criterion of what is our sexuality is it's dismissed. Remember, nature is a construct. So we refashion that construct as we please. And this separation of the consciousness from the body is well, deadly for who and what we are as a human person. I, now I'd like to go into one more piece with this because it's so critical, yeah. so critical. Progressivism, keeping in mind this 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 um, the opposition between philosophy of consciousness and philosophy of uh, existence, progressivism with its emphasis on consciousness, okay, uh, so that reality becomes an assemblage of the of constructs okay but progressivism has ultimately liquidated the human person i call it the missing person in progressivism what do i mean 
in our tradition, the person, the hylomorphic unity of um, spirit, matter, body, and soul, okay? Um, and there is emphasis on individual reasoning, autonomy. That's what constituted us as persons. We grow and develop. We become better persons um, um, uh, as we uh, understand the importance of the virtues, etc. The person, however, as fundamentally an individual, as I said, is liquidated in progressivism. Why? progressivism's inherent collectivism rooted in social justice wants to view people as moments, as perhaps little atoms in some kind of collective organism. So consequently, the politics of identity emerge. Remember, back in the late 60s, there was a, a, an axiom among feminists. The political is the personal and the personal is the political. Okay? The wicked irony of that was that the person, as we believe, an individual, um, is uh, eliminated with such politics of identity. And we can only think of our identities in terms of groups, in groups. Um, mm -hmm. We have, you know, a, an ethnic, ethnic identity. We have a um, racial identity. We have a gender identity. And all these identities are, again, a whole, a collective of which we are merely a moment apart. What happens to the human person as an individual in such um, grouping? Huh? The individual person becomes, becomes merely an epiphenomenon, something not real, an epiphenomenon of whatever group identity creature you're talking about. Uh, now those groups can intersect. They talked about intersectionality between various groups and uh, so on and so forth. And But what's lost is the human person, the individual. And consider there are eschatological uh, repercussions of this because if we lo lose the individual, what happens to our immortal soul. What happens to the promise of salvation? Our faith is undercut at a most elemental level, a most basic level. The belief in the promise of Jesus that there will be another life, an afterlife. And we as an individual will survive, will survive our uh, deaths, um, our mortal deaths. Uh, this is extremely serious. Um, um, I guess it accounts for, um, when you consider the eschatological repercussions there, I think it accounts for the um, degree to which Progressive cannot abide religious belief, Christianity, uh, Judaism, cannot abide any kind of religious position set like that. Um, um, in fact, is this 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 I think Oga's claim today about the emergence of um, the uh, Christian nationalism. Mm. Uh, that's being spread today. Uh, clearly, it's a progressive um, attempt to defend their ad agenda. We don't want traditional morality. It will uh, traditional morality 
that will maybe supplant our um, uh, social justice, our incoherent social justice uh, morality. Uh, and we don't want them to be thinking of a, a soul, some kind of spiritual substance that is indeed individualized ultimately. We can't abide that because we have to have a collective. That collective ensures our economics and ultimately it um, um, uh, contributes to the culture we want to develop. Yeah. That's, that's a little long-winded, but it, I think it's such oh. a critical point that, I, that the very question of personal immortality is undercut because of the progressives' um, liquidation of the individual human person. Yeah, that's the, that. Now you definitely see who's behind <laughs> progressivism for the condemnation of souls. Uh, it's um, it's it's obvious how Satan definitely he acts in a very nuanced in the socio political realm. But yeah, that's the end goal, and that's yeah. You, you it's a philosophy that closes off to individual salvation, as you say, that eschatological, uh, yeah, really a dilemma. Um, that's an understatement dilemma, but obviously it is tremendous. It's, um, you know, to, to establish a lot of things you said, there's a lot of ideas coming to my head, but really to establish human dignity, we have to say what human is and what that human is has to be immutable. If his dignity and worth is going to be unchangeable, there has to be something unchangeable about man. So really, I, I see progressivism, and you can comment on this, as essentially an attack on the immutable. Which is which is directly or indirectly an attack on God, because God is the basis of all immutability, and uh, based on that, there are re and reality in its most fundamental uh, aspect is immutable, right? And that's how, how we have definitions of things we're able to know um, reality. So it's kind of like how even philosophy was born that through Thales he realized that. Um, you know, everything changes. The most obvious reality is things change. Yes, everything changes. But deep down, there has to be a subject of change that it, that does not change. So it's it, it's such a metaphysical problem that the a denial that has some tremendous ulterior consequences. So like you mentioned, anthropocentrism, and I like how you say it, it separates man from reality um, because it, it, it just it hyper focuses on man to the to the point that it doesn't conform to reality. So it's like a anthropocentric uh, exceptionalism, we can say also. But now there's an extreme reaction to that. Or some people could say it's a consequence of that because sometimes with extremes, we we battle one extreme with the opposite extreme <laughs> because we're just, uh, we lack virtue in general, right? H humanity, so we, we tend to jump the extreme. So now from, from postmodernism, and, and we could talk about postmodernism a little bit, which is an interesting phenomenon. But just the name post is just denotes that that the time period doesn't it's not very substantial. Post, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't even have a name of its own. It's just defined on what it what's before it. Postmodernism. So now we're seeing a, a posthumanism, posthumanism, and this is the philosophy of today, and posthumanism as a response to anthropocent uh, uh, you know anthropocentric uh, and anthropocentrism yes yeah, a response it seems to be the opposite it seems to and, and and it's within the same binary in progressivism the 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 um those who who oppress and the oppressor the oppressed and the oppressor so really the oppressors now is humanity and the oppressed are in non-human entities so with post-humanism you're trying you're looking for non-human excellence or you're trying to change man, the whole cyborg theory, um, which I won't get into, but trying to change man or uh, redefine man away from nature, kind of give man an artificial definition like a cyborg, for example. Uh, it can't be. It can't be because man has to have this immutable uh, reality, his definition, and he's really defined by his soul, right? This, this, this integral unity between man uh, uh, body and soul forming a person so this this post-humanism 
is an effect of progressivism because again this this as you mentioned nature is fluid why not like you're just constantly accepting and accepting uh change and the whole notion of freedom also which you alluded to is negative freedom exists but they absolutize negative freedom so then you have foundations like freedom from religion which is freedom is, is essentially for the good for the true but if when you when you absolutize negative freedom freedom from then there's an interesting book written by it's a, it's a phd in Notre dame i think i think it was his phd thesis i forget his name now but Notre dame and um publications and the name of the book is called freedom from reality and this is the ultimate consequence that we can say of liberalism progressivism freedom from reality and on the on the cover it has john locke but with like a, a picasso uh, kind of as if picasso painted john locke so it's like his nose is over here his face is here and freedom from reality very very academic book very interesting and it, it makes all those connections so um yeah basically it's it's this this fluidity that is really at base at the metaphysical problem with progressivism but if can you talk a, a little bit about postmodernism because i know it is like a you can say an ideological soup where kind of it's all it is all inclusive it's it's really hard to kind of pin down but what kind of at least according to the work in, after justice what aspects of postmodernism do you kind of uh focus on and why do you focus on those for in 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 your work i want to um just uh remark on um and that was a uh Good riff. <laughs> some, uh, <laughs> put together some uh, ideas. Very yeah, well. a lot of um, things throughout you. You have a comment on whatever you want. So you don't. You don't even have to answer. But the I, I, I will get the postmodern. <laughs> I will get the postmodernism. Um, but um, our tradition, our our Catholic, our, the Christian tradition, uh, even in general, um, is. Um, is uh, uh, privileged uh, uh, by um, what um, Jacques Maritain and many others have called the perennial philosophy, the perennial philosophy. And you take that description, perennial philosophy, that is a philosophy which seeks the immutable, which, which seeks the first principles, huh? First principles are unchangeable. Um, um, uh, uh, that perennial philosophy has sustained our faith um, and complements our faith. Um, uh, it's not known much to today, however, unfortunately. But that perennial philosophy has sustained our faith for um, oh, more than a millennium, huh? Um, um, for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, um, and. It is precisely what progressivism disparages. Precisely what they disparage. Uh, um, you can't have um, a perennial philosophy. Why a perennial philosophy implies that there are these uh, eternal verities. Huh? That there is a uh, transcendence beyond our subjective consciousness and our um, uh, mishmash of identities uh, that are allowed by progressivism. Uh, um, that there's something higher. In fact, even something higher than the state, the government. Um, it is a, a, an old saw of Marxism you can't admit religion into your society and you have to, as much as possible, suppress religion um, because there can be nothing uh, higher, no greater authority than the state. That's why uh, the, our founders in the Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution um, um, recognize that 
there is a creator and this order and design comes from the creator um there's got to be something higher than the state that can't be admitted for the progressives now postmodernism which is i claim derivative from progressivism um is not really after modern, the modern era. It's really just anti-modernism. I think so much of postmodernism is a kind of Nietzschean bellyache. Huh? It, 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 it's kind of the way in which Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil and um, um, other, uh, Zarathustra even, um, um, he whined about the condition of society and these oppressive, uh, 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 su suppressing uh, um, uh, mores of society. Um, uh, um. Remember, too, that N Nietzsche originally was a philologist. Uh, um, he, I mean, he studied words and origins of words and meanings and so on. Um, when you look at people like uh, Derrida and others of that ilk, you see the, a similar kind of thing. Um, language is a construct, okay? Yeah, there's a, in terms of spoken language, there's a kind of natural connection between the spoken word and uh, what our uh, uh, voice boxes and so on are capable of, capable of emitting naturally, okay? But all in all, language is a construct, and that construct uh, can be manipulated. It's precise for the postmoderns. Um, they contend that language defines, it generates our subjective consciousness, the things the ideas and so on of our subjective consciousness emerge from the language we use. So if you can change the language, you can change subjective consciousness. If you can enforce a certain kind of language, you can ultimately, um, the result is going to be the consciousness that you want the ideas, the representations, the phantasms, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be, uh, constructed constructs in your consciousness. Um, so, I mean, that's the basis of propaganda and indoctrination. Um, Postmodernism was all about that, all about that. And in doing so, um, I mean, they had to, of course, uh, oppose um, modern um, um, rationalism. Uh, rationalism claimed that the, the to the power of reason alone, you can arrive at these um, uh, truths um, uh, uh, to an extent, even immutable truths. Um, Kant being an example, Emmanuel Kant being an example of that kind of rationalism. Uh, many others, uh, uh, Kant as one of the early examples. Uh, but postmodernism couldn't abide rationalism. Human reason can't handle the truth. They, it can't handle the truth uh, because there is no truth except what consciousness constructs, fabricates. So for the postmodern, um, reality is constructed ultimately by a, a language influence consciousness. Um, so uh, consciousness becomes then um, a um, outcome. And what we know as reality, even more so an outcome of um, what is constructed within the postmoderns um, manipulation of language. Um, um, Postmodernism pretty much died in the early 2000s as, as a movement, uh, but it gave rise to the politically correct, 
Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, so many of the other uh, cancel culture and uh, ultimately wokeism. All of those are derivative forms of progressivism. Progressivism manifested itself um, over the decades in those kinds of forms. Uh, today, I think the most prominent form is the um, woke culture. Um, and look at the woke culture. Now, we it's not so much a, a focus on language, um, uh, such as um, Derrida and Saucer and other postmodernists uh, did. No, no, the focus is on the digital bit, huh? the digital bit, TikTok, Instagram, and so on. Uh, um, um, that's the focus. It, it, it's almost with certain kinds of uh, the, the, in, the propaganda and indoctrination occurs with social and through social media. And it's incredible how influential this is. Um, um, uh, um, you know, consider what do we have? These influencers, influencers are called thought leaders. Holy cow. Yeah. On social media, thought leaders. <laughs> but that's what they're doing. And that's what postmodernism aimed to in terms of its um, um, analyses and, 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 and control over language. Uh, so um, it's, it's a uh, multi, uh, over the decade, multi-pronged effort to, uh, as much as possible, um, um, instantiate their collective politics and economics within culture. Um, it's being forced on culture. It's not growing organically within culture. It's being forced on culture um, uh, by political leadership and um, economic threats, so to speak. Uh, but uh, um, it is what is uh, posing itself a as a, uh, a, a serious, serious challenge for um, for us today. Um, the perennial philosophy, I believe, will not disappear. The perennial philosophy, our Aristotelian Thomistic heritage, will survive. In fact, I believe Raphael, as um, Jacques Maritain said, will survive to bury our undertakers. Huh? Mm. To mm -hmm. bury our undertakers. Ultimately, the progressive movement will unravel. And you talked earlier about the uh, interest in economics. It will begin with economics because um, when through economics, our individual autonomy, our individual choice is being uh, stifled, is being uh, defined. Mm -hmm. Options are being limited um, uh, by, uh, by Ideal, collectivist ideology. Um, I mean, uh, 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 there will be a resistance. And for us Catholics, the more we can uh, share our um, own tradition, show how it can enrich us in these uh, times of uh, need, so to speak, um, 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 the more we're going to be able to, um, um, the more we're going to be able to make room for that truth to reemerge. Right. right. Well, beautifully said. Yeah, that's um, definitely. It's uh, what you say with kind of referring to consciousness as an outcome. It's, it's fascinating. I'm thinking of the cart, the or at least the um, extreme Cartesian view that. First, you have thinking that thinking as a cause of being, which is, I don't think that's what Descartes meant, but ideas definitely have consequences. You know, even if a, a philosopher is, if he's saying something profound in a naive type of way, it can have very bad consequences if it's not clear. So I think, therefore, I am, though necessarily that, that could be taken in an orthodox sound view, has it's like, wait, well, why, why are you starting from thought? And it can be understood as thinking as causing of thought, which is, I think, is what we're getting into with postmodernism. And interesting, you say, well, you said postmodernism is dead. I, I want to ask you, 
kind of, and, and then maybe we could kind of wrap this up because this is kind of looking towards today and what you think, because um, I did hear like post postmodernism, post post postmodernism, again, showing that time periods are don't have a substance uh, are not substantial. And this is coming from progress. This is seemingly what progressivism wants, drive everything to the ground, ultimately, in every in every way. So uh, and so that kind of is postmodernism morphing or is there is there a reaction to that? Because I think even progressivism, in a sense, people reacting to that um, and, and you're seeing conservatism kind of flourish. I don't know if you're well aware of the, the elections in Europe, um, even though these might be just conservatives in name only, what they call the ultra like the media, the ultra right. You know, if you have the media as an enemy that you're. I think you're you're doing well, <laughs> in my view, because I think the media, uh, definitely their ideologues in the, in the progressivist camp, but they're calling them the ultra right. The ultra right has has you know they have won um, uh, certain seats here in, in in Europe, though they may be right in name only. But so are we seeing a type of pushback and a conservative? Because I I teach younger people and and I'm, I'm I am starting to see a, a kind of that people are tired of progressivism. People are tired of, of, of woke ideology or of transgenderism, which is another, we can say, um, another effect of progressivism. Are we seeing a shift here or, and then we'll, yeah, we'll kind of wrap it up here, but yeah, go ahead. If you can, uh, what do you think? And I, I, I think, I, I agree. I think there is. And I want to go back to what you said, what you observed earlier. And, um, and I've seen this too with, um, uh, uh, my students um, um, uh, throughout the uh, 20 teens and early uh, 2020s, um, um, it's economics. I mean, you said earlier that progressivism is ultimately uh, going to uh, kill itself, so to speak. Huh? Uh, uh, it has throughout throughout the decades. Um, Socialist economies collapse. They can't sustain themselves. There are many reasons for that. I'm not going to go into that. That's a fact of history. Socialist economies collapse. And that's and because and because for progressives, that kind of socialist economy is critical for enacting their um, uh, social justice agenda. Huh? Um, um, that's where the changes are going to happen uh, um, first. And we're seeing that with young people. Uh, we're seeing that with uh, all of those of us who um, just can't handle going to the grocery store and paying um, uh, $130 for what used to cost $98. Huh? It's that kind of... And that's going to occur. I mean, it occurred in Europe in the 19th, 20th centuries, uh, um, 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 where um, economic failure is um, the origin, huh? Can very well be. And I think we're experiencing that, the origin. But the problem here today with young people, too, is that. Yeah, they can see the economic failure of progressive socialism. That kind of collectivism doesn't work. And they um, want to resist it. And they um, uh, denounce it. Uh, um, uh, but what's the alternative? They can't articulate, unfortunately, because they never were taught it, a coherent uh, uh, statement a coherent um, a philosophy of free market economy. They just don't know it. They really don't know what it means um, because they've never seen it. Uh, uh, that's, I think, um, the long and short of it. They've never experienced it. Uh, they've never been taught it. All they've been taught is, oh, you know, um, you've got the... Uh, the bourgeois and the, and the and the proletariat and all that. I mean, those Marxist tropes. That's all I know. And given that, 
they see the uh, deterioration of the economy, the, the, the financial hardships place. Uh, and then, for example, um, a, a clever progressivist um, like the Biden administration, clever progressivist, um, will, um, well, we'll cover your student loans, you know, um, for the young. We'll cover your student loan. Oh, great. Okay, Santa Claus government now is uh, getting me out of debt. You know, that kind of thing. It's right. um, They don't know what free market economy really is because they've never studied its principles. And they certainly haven't studied for uh, people of religious background. They certainly haven't studied how free market economy is vital to our own Catholic heritage. I mean, for me... One of the greatest works of the 20th century was um, Centesium Wasanus. I mean, that encyclical is, is just tremendous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely tremendous. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, and uh, I've seen versions of it put into teaching format. I've taught sections of it many times over the years. We've got to establish that alternative, um, it becomes vital, necessary if the economy of socialist collectivist economy is rejected. And uh, we've got to, um, there's no question, because um, these uh, young people, uh, the Gen Zs and, and, and the millennials have to have an alternative. Um, and, um, our Catholic tradition has had one for hundreds of years. We might as well uh, uh, revive it. Uh, it's necessary. Yeah. But there's something else. It's, we're, we're kind of finishing up here. I know there's something I do want to talk about before yeah. we um, kind of close this uh, interview. Um, and that is a critical notion, hope. Because... Uh, and may may I yes. talk about that a little bit because oh, yes, yes. I think it's important Maybe to end with that. Oh uh, yeah, it's vital <clears throat> because yeah, these challenges um, from progressivists and the derivative forms we've talked about in, in terms of the postmoderns and the uh, uh, cancel culture, etc. What really has to be understood is that there is obviously room for hope. Always choose hope. And what do I mean by hope? Well, first of all, our Catholic heritage, philosophically, is a realist tradition. By that, I mean metaphysical, epistemological, and moral real, realism are tr the traits, the foundational traits of our heritage. Metaphysical realism, the created, the God-created universe has an order and design. It's not chaos, okay? Um, it has an order and design, epistemological realism, which can be known by human, not exhaustively, but it can be known by human reason. We can have knowledge of objective reality, the order of objective reality. Of course, not exhaustively, but we can. Moreover, there is a real difference between right and wrong, moral realism. So metaphysical epistemological and moral realism. John Paul II teaches us that only realists can truly hope. Mm. If no realism, no genuine hope. Hope is a supernatural virtue. Faith, hope, and charity, as we know. Why? Let me talk about hope now more specifically. Hope is not optimism, and it's certainly not pessimism. Let me explain. 
both optimism and pessimism are, in a sense, egocentric or anthropocentric, if you will. The pessimist whines, wah, 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 things didn't turn out. I didn't get what I wanted. Um, um, I uh, didn't uh, see uh, uh, the outcomes of what I desired. The pessimist is mainly, mainly concerned with me, myself, and I. The optimist says, oh, no, I will uh, uh, change things. I will make reality conform to what I want. Things will be what I desire. Again, that, too, is anthropocentric. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with optimism, but what I am saying is that it's not hope. Pessimism, and certainly not pessimism, that's obvious, but optimism isn't hope, okay? There's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but it's not hope. What is hope? Hope is the humble deference to an order which exists and it is greater than I am. Hope is not egocentric or anthropocentric. Hope defers to this order and such deference, we transcend ourselves. You see, for the um, optimist, optimism is self-referential. It's what, you know, I my will be done. My will be done. For hope, no, it's thy will be done. You see, it's self, it, it humbles itself before the order and design created by, created by God. That's an objective order in design. Without realism, metaphysical, epistemological, and moral realism, there is no hope because there's no self transcendence. There's no, it's all within the closed circle of subjective consciousness, of the I and the Hope is transcend, tra you know, as I early on in this interview, uh, John Paul II's cross, crossing the threshold of hope is uh, very important. And it's written for the lay folks. You know, it's there are questions posed and answers given. It's, it's just wonderfully done. Um, but that concept of hope is, I think, it is what um, sustained Augustine. One of the, I think, virtues of Augustinian writing. Yeah, he was in a time of challenge like this. Things were in upheaval uh, in the in the church and with the faith, to be sure. And Augustine um, experimented uh, with all kinds of lifestyles, okay? Um, from the Manichaean to the Libertine and so on. Um, uh, but what emerges in his writings uh, is a genuine hope. A genuine, because he humbles himself before the order of God. Mm. Um, um, yeah, Augustine is influenced heavily by Platonic idealism, but underneath it all, he is a realist. There is an order, there is a divine ordained order, and we have to plug into it. I mean, that's hope. Hope, hope. When we hear politicians, I recall when... Um, during um, in the Obama uh, campaigns and so on, um, there was all this hope going around and, and whatnot. Even with Clinton and, other, you know, the man from hope, Clinton um, uh, claimed to be. In politics, there's no hope, typically, uh, especially not progressive politics, because in progressive, any uh, 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 views, in progressive views in general, um, you're within your own consciousness. It's all it's all anthropocentric. Mm -hmm. It's all about me, myself, and I. Man is the measure of all things. There's nothing beyond our constructs that are human-made constructs. No, you can't hope there. You can't. There's no hope there. You gotta recognize that it's beyond me. It's greater than I am, and 
um, we have to uh, defer prey, huh? That um, um, that the, the spirit of hope, the the grace of hope, can uh, energize us in what we do uh, in terms of attempting to um, sustain and spread the perennial philosophy. Yeah, no, beautiful, beautifully said. I mean, today because of that closed-in subjectivity, belief, hope, they don't have any content. So literally, I, I asked someone this because they were talking about belief. It was a talk, believing, believing. And I had a question. What do we believe in? They just say, they their answer was just just believe. <laughs> what, what is that? It literally means nothing. So it's believe in yourself, right? They didn't say that, though, but just believe. But believe in yourself. So it's, it's extreme subjectivity without a content. But the realizing of that content, extra mental outside of myself that's not me is really my conversion was philosophical at starting because i was really steeped in that subjectivity which is uh you're in a box you know once you realize there's that content there which is realism like real you know reality exists outside of me i can know it right once you realize that that, that god exists god is right god god has revealed himself then this becomes the, the object of hope. So very, very well said. And um, just Plato, I, 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 you know, I don't, I, I know people see him as an idealist, but, but I, I definitely Plato, for me, is an ultra realist. For me, is an ultra realist. I think that's how Augustine saw him. But I know, I understand because one extreme leads to another. So ultra realism. <laughs> You know, if you believe definitions have are independent uh, entities, you will you will fall into an idealism. So it really is that hey, the one extreme falls to another. So, but definitely, I understand. Uh, That's interesting. Whole Plato idealist, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so get get um, Doctor Thomas's book. Uh, I will leave the copy of the book here in this thumbnail, a picture of it, and I will put the link. Um, for in route publications where it's published at and the Amazon link where you could buy it. So it's called after justice, Catholic challenges to progressive culture, politics, economics, and education. And read this because it's, it, it provides very apt principles to interpret uh, what's going on today. We have to know history to, to be able to, to apply its principles uh, mm -hmm. to our contemporary times so we can know them. Right. So we are adequately, prepared we know how to live according to them because right you can't really do without knowledge so important to know all right so we'll end it at this uh, at this thank you very much uh dr thomas for staying with us and um hopefully we'll see you in another video and uh god bless